nonviolent resistance that ousted Milosevic. There is no question. Was anybody optimistic that they would prevail? No. They, they like Gandhi, said, we can't listen to these pessimists. We have to do what we feel and know is right. They were very courageous people. I also worked with cross-ethnic mediators, some of the minorities in the Ukraine, seeking mutual understanding to build the community needed for nonviolent resistance in Ukraine. And then I am certainly not going to be, I didn't get a chance to visit Nepal this visit, and I'm not an expert on Nepal. But 12 years ago, I was invited to Nepal, no, it was 15 years ago, to bring mediation to Nepalis throughout Nepal because they were seeking to model to their government a more Gandhian way of responding to the Maoist terrorists. And, so, and mediation since. I was not one of the group that went, but many Fulbrights and former ambassadors went to Nepal, and mediation is present throughout Nepal right now. Um, so that's another example of where these conflict skills to combine with nonviolence, combined with other things I'm well aware, we can have that discussion later, are leading to transformation. Now, micro practice briefly, I'm going to introduce our ethical principles so that you're aware of how Gandhi's spirit lives on today. Self-determination is the fundamental underlying principle. People who have grown up under oppressive circumstances, and as a woman I would say I understand some of this, they learn to be helpless, passive victims. This must be, as Gandhi knew so well, challenged and changed for social change to occur. My students are learning how to empower people who have less power at the table. Many of us internalize our oppression. Uh, we have all known women who are women's worst enemies, right? Have you known some of this? I think it's throughout the world. And um, I must say I'm a little concerned the number of times I've heard Indians praising Britain while I've been here this month. It's, uh, it's predictable. I'm like, now I have things I like about Britain, but couldn't you pick some other countries and cultures? You know, this doesn't make sense. Once again, considering alternatives and the consequences of alternatives is key to empowering people to be negotiating on their own behalf. And to be at, in a conflict resolution process, you need a basic capacity to represent yourself, to speak up. My students are learning to help all individuals, no matter what their circumstances, appreciate their own worth and capacity to solve life problems. But sometimes individuals can't do it alone, so they need power allies. Now I don't know, it's complicated how lawyers uh, operate in India, uh, but in my country there are still lawyers who help the poor who can be power allies, uh, who if a woman has been uh, beaten at home, they can be there to support her and ensure that there's power balancing at the table. Sometimes it's extended family, sometimes other people. Now we have ethics officers that help balance power at the table. I don't know if your vigilance officers would be people you would trust to do that, but that's some of the process of conflict resolution. If power cannot be, there are many sources of power. Gandhi knew the power of persuasion. He's one of our great teachers for persuasion. My students study power and how to give power to people who don't have power. Being at the table is actually power that Gandhi fought for. And I'll tell you, I've had, uh, I've had uh, citizens of Burma come to me and say, if you could only teach us how to get to the table, how to negotiate, that is all we need. They're not invited. And so nonviolent resistance might be a means to get to the table. The other piece that we focus on is shared power. 
And I, I've talked already quite a bit this morning. I'm not going to go into details, but it's a very important source of power, our alliances and support. The students I teach, and if you ever have a mediator in Delhi High Court, I hope you don't, or the Supreme Court, they must be as impeccably impartial as Gandhi, otherwise it is not an ethical process. So you must be, if you are a woman, introduced equally with the men at the table. If you are the person with less power, you must have as much time to speak and be as recognized and heard as the most powerful. It takes a lot of courage to play this role. He had the rare ability to unite so many, and that is exactly what we're trying to teach our students. Now, we are teaching our students to do this across culture, across gender, across religion. So you can imagine it takes a lifetime of reflective practice and skill mastery. And I've already mentioned, if there is a lack of party good faith, a lack of power balancing, we consider other options. And I, Gandhi certainly would have promoted nonviolence, but I think our whole legal system uh, internationally, now I'm not going to talk about India's legal system or courts, but human rights cases are ways of balancing the power and pushing for good faith. We need to consider these alternatives too. This is what good faith means, that people are honest, that they share the information necessary to benefit all at the table. I, I want to share with you what I say to my students every semester teaching ethics. My students never lie. It's only the person next to them who lies. Human nature. We fool ourselves. We see ourselves in the best possible light. And so part of the ethical training is to let students know that actually human nature flatters. And we have to uh, engage in rigorous self-scrutiny, self-honesty to see ourselves as others see us. In fact, at our worst, we see in others what is actually within. They are being asked to live as Gandhi aspired with moral congruence that they walk their talk, because if they do not, none of us will trust them with our most important concerns and conflicts. And we must teach them, as I've described, actively with experiential learning, and they must embark on a lifetime of skill mastery and self-reflection. I see that as very much Gandhian with ethics. Because all the way during the lecture, the students were in your picture. And uh, that is uh, just uh, super for a professor. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, so from there only, I would like to uh, comment on this part, that the last uh, slide spoke about the transformation. What all is happening in the time of uh, Gandhi, we had the education, also little bit of information, but all those uh, could not be integrated. But, uh, that uh, we could not have the proper understanding of his thoughts, what actually he wanted to. And uh, 31 times about the world mediator. Gandhi uh, was never a mediator to me. Because, because he always thought of himself as a simple person who has experimented and let it be, let it now reach to the masses. And then only the truth came as the very first thing of the establishment of the of one's life. And that is why when people started thinking about that whatever we are telling is truth, then only uh, Gandhi could know that really uh, the people are not telling a lie, but are speaking the truth which should have come 
to the masses in its own form. So coming to the uh, point uh, which I just wanted to want to have the explanation uh, because I personally feel that I could not understand that is that uh, at one point of time Gandhi to you was an entrepreneur. One point of time Gandhi to you was an entrepreneur. Anything for himself but was performing the thing for the nation. Oh, interesting. Okay. Do you mind if I could yeah. respond? Yeah. So, so, so my uh, question is that uh, how do you rate him as, at this point of time, as a conflict resolver? Okay. Yeah. Very quickly. Yeah. Thank you. As of serving people, the most critical need, but the fact that they have included entrepreneur with their service is a contradiction. It's confusing. So I'm not suggesting that Gandhi was the entrepreneur. I was suggesting that this is some way that we in 2012 are uh, emulating service. I hope that helps. The social entrepreneur concept still needs to be studied. There's a lot of questions there. But as a conflict resolver, that's what I see a mediator as. And Gandhi was a mediator, though a party mediator. He did, as a lawyer, help people reach resolution. And so I certainly see him as a conflict resolver because he, he advocated and organized for justice in the highest moral ground. Uh, but I, so I put those two together. Conflict